go ahead and get started here in uh, our lesson. We've been looking at 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, about all Scripture is breathed by God and profitable for teaching, etc. We'll read it in a second. But um, I wanted to uh, take a look at the first thing that's said there. Uh, we, we looked at last time at kind of the overview of how this fits into the context of what Timothy is saying, or I'm sorry, what Paul is telling Timothy. But I want to look today specifically at this part of the, um, the first part of the 16th verse where he said that all Scripture is breathed out by God. At 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. Um, but you know, the entire context is that the, this scripture is breathed by God and it is also useful or profitable and it accomplishes some specific things for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Meaning injustice or in righteousness, meaning uh, not just any teaching, reproof, correction, or training, but in the spiritual context, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the person who is working on behalf of God, the man of God, whoever that person might be, is completely supplied with everything they need by means of the Scripture. Well, that's the big picture on 2 Timothy 3. And uh, again, you see leading up to this that Paul suffered greatly uh, at the hands of well, the, the people, um, both the Jews and the Gentiles in Thessalonica and Ephesus and other places, um, which is recorded earlier here in 2 Timothy. And Timothy himself learned from his mother and his grandmother in the faith of God. But the point of all of those things was not they who lived before him and did what was right. It was the scripture that they believed in, the scripture that they held to. And so it is for Paul as he writes to Timothy, and so it is for us today. Since he is gone, we have only the writings. But I wanted to start with a simple thing about the scripture being breathed out by God because it's not that it's actually not that simple in a way. I want it to stay simple, but it's not that simple in the sense that there are a lot of assumptions baked in to the way that this is being translated for us. And I would like us not to um, not to just have those assumptions, but but actually understand what's being put forward here, because there is something uh, specific that God means by saying it this way, that all Scripture is breathed out by God. There's a specific meaning to this. So first, let's define the term Scripture, and I don't, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here on these things, but we do need to understand some basics about definitions to understand where this is coming from, why he's saying it this way, because it does mean something specific that we're getting to. But the scripture, the word for scripture is um, is a, a word that, you know, comes into English as graph, right? Um, but it's, it's a word that it means typically writing. Uh, literally, it's a representation by means of lines. <laughs> If you want to think about it, that's what writing is. It's using lines to represent something, drawing lines to represent something. And I'm giving you this definition in the Greek because I want you to see what this word means in the original so that you understand how we got to the word Scripture from there. Scripture is not wrong. That, that's what he means, obviously what he means. But by saying scripture, you're already assuming something. Right? The word scripture does refer to holy writ. It's a very specific English term that refers to a sacred text, something that is from God for us. That meaning is not inherent in the term that the Greek uses. It doesn't have to mean that. It's just the word for writing is all it is. 
You keep going down the list of definitions. Oh, sorry, the, it's drawing, a drawing or a delineation, which if you think about it, it's like Chinese using the characters, which are, some of them are still pictographs, but most of them now are ideographs. They don't actually represent in some kind of drawing what they mean anymore, although some of them still do. But you go from there to written language, right? Drawn or painted things, writing or the art of writing. And the fourth definition, the thing that is being written, the writing itself. So this also is used of various written documents, letters, statements, writings, books, catalogs, inscriptions, manuscripts. Why am I saying this? Because when God uses this word, he's already begun to make the argument with us. <laughs> when he uses a word that just means writing, that's all it is. That's what it means, the thing that was written down. Scripture means the writing, the thing that was written down. We don't have any question about that. The question is, who wrote it? That's the issue. There's an argument inherent in the way that he's using the, in, in the fact that he's using this word. When he says writing, the writing, what writing? All writing is inspired by God. All writing, really? Everything that I have on my person? And, no. He's talking about something specific, and you know he is. Who wrote it down? And that's why he said, all writing is God breathed. Breathed out by God. Divinely inspired, some say. Um, I forget what the other ones will do, but uh, I think you say divinely inspired in King James, and this English standard goes with breathed out by God. I think that covers most of the translations. This word is actually a, a new word in Greek in the New Testament. It's new in the New Testament. It's a coin. Paul is the first one I know of that used this word, and it is a compound of the word God and breathed. <laughs> so it's made out of God breathed this thing. So all the writing, all the scripture, the, all that we consider scripture, if you will, the Holy Writ, is the writing that was breathed by God. As for God, well, you know what Theo or Theos means. That's God. I think everybody understands that probably, so I'm going to skip it. But let's talk about breathing, because this is an interesting thing. The breath that he's talking about is a very concrete idea of forced air, air that is blown, air that has power behind it, that is being impelled or pushed. It's therefore breathing, because when we're breathing, we're forcing air in and out. Um, I think this comes up in air conditioning systems of forced air. That idea of something is acting on this to cause air to move back and forth, right? There's energy behind it. There's a blast or a wind or metaphorically influence, air or spirit. So you get down the list, that's where you get the word spirit from. And it is literally what everywhere in your New Testament that says spirit is talking about this word that generally means breath. It's the pneuma, uh, it's the pneuma in the pneumatic tools, you know, the, the air wrenches, the pneumatic tools, well, they're air powered. That's forced air, they're blown, you know. Um, Pneumatic tubes. I loved that it, when I worked at the university. The Keys office still had pneumatic tubes <laughs> to move things up, down, upstairs and downstairs. They'd be a little shoot there, and they would pop it, and, shoop, and the key would come up, forced by air through the tube to come to you. That was kind of fun. Or when they were done with the key, they would spirit it away, stick it into the pneumatic tube, and off it would go to, who knows, there's probably this huge pile of keys underground somewhere. But breath, respiration, and therefore, you know, far down the list, it's life, a thing that breathes. And then we could maybe use it for divine inspiration or somebody's inspiration or genius, where do their ideas come from? And then maybe it comes to mean the spirit of a god or of a man. 
And finally, some immaterial being, some spiritual being, you know, an angel or something like this. But my point is, you look how far down the definitions we find Scripture and inspire or in spirit or, or breathe, breathe, you know. My point is, we're losing some of the force of what God is trying to tell us by assuming the definition <laughs> of Scripture and Spirit. What he's saying is, the Scriptures, as we know them, the Bible, was indeed penned by human beings. That is true. But they were given breath by God. That's what he's saying. When he says all Scripture is inspired by God, he's not saying you should believe the Bible because God spoke the Bible, although that's true. What he's saying is what makes it the Bible is the fact that God breathed it. What got written is exactly what God intended to get written. That's the meaning of this. The spirit, the genius behind it, the breath behind the words you know, that are being recorded in these writings is God's breath. He's the genius, the mind, the spirit behind this. Even though human beings wrote it down, it's of divine origin. God's the one who breathed those words that got written. So this is the argument that he's making, and that's the reason that I wanted to slow down and talk about those definitions first, you know, just to shed a little bit of light on the concrete there so that you can see he's using this terminology so as to establish this point. Yep, human beings wrote it down, but no matter. The thing they wrote down is what's important, and that thing is the thing that God himself breathed out. Those are the words that God himself impelled into the word, into the world, into existence. So we're going to go to exhibit A, which is Romans 3. <laughs> the scriptures are written by mankind, but they are given breath by God. Come with me to Romans chapter 3. And that's the, the major point here. <coughs> we have to make, I think, the broadest point first, the simplest point first, which is Romans 3, 2. The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. The Jews or the Judeans, Judah, were entrusted with the oracles of God. We have to make the first point be the broadest one, which is this. The Bible, every book of this Bible has been given to the rest of us, the whole rest of the world, by the ancient Israelites. Every book of this Bible was written down by the Jews, Romans 3, 2. They were the nation that was entrusted with the oracles of God. The oracles being those utterances of God, the things that he himself said that are put forward for us. Um, you know, 1 Peter 4, uh, 11 says, whoever speaks, let him speak as it were, the oracles of God. Meaning when you teach or when you preach, you have to be sure that what you're saying is, in fact, biblical and is right. Um, but it's also the word that is used all over Psalm 119. Um, if you're familiar with Psalm 119, you may know it's a very lengthy acrostic about the word of God. That word is the oracle, the oracles with which the Jews were entrusted, Romans 3, 2. So what's happening? Well... All the Bible comes to us by way of the Jews. The Jews were the ones who had the Bible. They tell us what's in the Bible. There is not this scramble, as people sometimes claim, uh, in the third or fourth century after the Lord's um, ascension, 
to try and figure out what the books of the Bible are, what's the canonical Old Testament, that doesn't exist. Um, all of the books of the Bible were given to us by the Jews. They decided what was in the Bible, and they decided what was not in the Bible. They had access to all of the deuterocanonical books, sometimes called apocryphal books, that you'll find in Catholic Bibles and the Bibles uh, that the Church of England uses and some other traditions. Uh, they were aware of that. They knew about that, but they did not include those in their Bible. And Romans 3.2 tells us it was up to them. They were the ones entrusted with that. So there's no debate to be had about those books. They're not biblical. They're not inspired. The Jews never recognized those books as Scripture. They were entrusted with the oracles of God. What they gave us is what the Bible is. That's how that's going to be. But also, back in 2 Timothy, when he said the writings are God-breathed, he's distinguishing that voice of God in these writings from the voice of the nation of Israel or the voice of you know, those who speak that word to us, whether teachers among us or you know, parents who taught us or whatever it is, it, it's always the same thing. It's God who says this. It's God who authors this, whose breath is behind this, no matter who writes it down or who shares it with you. They're always just a vehicle. The content is from God. That's the first thing about Romans 3 that has to be said, and I think it should be said uh, very broadly. So there's no question what the books of the Bible are. There's no question, you know, where the authority for that comes from. But let's get to the substance here of Romans 3. Well, all right. So the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Yep, they were. They certainly were. But it's fairly easy to point out many instances in which the Jews did not obey God. They did not do right. Some of them proved to be unfaithful to God. Yeah. So what? <laughs> yeah, so? And so what? What are you implying, right? Well, what they're implying is, well, that means that what they wrote down isn't trustworthy, isn't perfect. See, that's what they're trying to do when they ask things like that. And Paul knew that, of course. The Holy Spirit through Paul knew that and said, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Yeah, what if some of them were unfaithful? You know what? Some of them were unfaithful. We absolutely know that that is true. Does it nullify the trustworthiness of God? Does it overthrow the authority of the law of Moses? No, it doesn't. It does not nullify the faithfulness of God. The fact that people do wrong doesn't change the rightness of God. The fact that people break faith doesn't mean that God is faithless. Does their untrustworthiness really is what it's saying? What if some, it says, what if some were unfaithful? Really, that's trustworthiness. What if some were untrustworthy? Does their untrustworthiness set aside the trustworthiness of God? No. The fact that people do wrong. Uh, you know, nobody denies that people do wrong. The question is, does it impact the faithfulness of God? Is God the minister of wrong if his people are doing wrong? No. Is God the author of sin if, if people sin? No. Is God doing wrong if he allows people to make choices, including the choice to sin? No. Yes, yeah, some of them sinned, so what? Let God be true, though every one of them was a liar. 
even if every one of them was a liar, every single one of them from, you know, Moses on down, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you want to say they're all liars. They're all liars. Okay, that's fine. Why is that fine? Because I don't know them and you don't know them either, and it doesn't matter. We're not supposed to know them. We're supposed to read what they wrote down. What if they were liars? What if they meant this in some evil way? It doesn't matter. That's the point. It doesn't matter. Whether they were or whether they weren't, that's the material. What matters is what is written. What is written. That's what was intended to be written. We don't know Moses. Why don't we know him? Because we're not supposed to know him. We're supposed to know what he wrote down. Was he a liar? I don't know, man. I don't think so. If you think he is, I guess I can't disprove that. But what has that got to do with the Word of God? Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Even if every author of this book had been a fraud and an evil imposter, writing you know, something with the intent of leading the world astray or whatever it was, it just doesn't matter. What actually got written down, what got captured in writing, is the thing that God breathed. That's what God intended to have written down. Whoever they were, however they did it, however it came about, is immaterial. What matters is what got written. That is the thing that God breathed. That's inspired. And there's an example of this, actually, uh, with the, the, the high priest in the time of Jesus, who was scolding his fellow priests, saying, you idiots, don't you know it's expedient for the nation that one man should die and not that we all be displaced? Remember the high priest was saying this to them? <laughs> and it said, since he was the high priest that year, he didn't say this of his own accord. But the Holy Spirit moved him to say that Jesus would die for the people. So there's an evil man, a fraud, an imposter, but he was a Jew. And he spoke something that God gave him to speak. In fact, it's the only words of his that we have recorded. <laughs> That's fascinating. The only thing he, we have from that guy is exactly what God caused to be written down that he said, and that was actually true. It's true Jesus would die, one man, on behalf of the whole nation. That's correct. That was inspired by God. Even though he had evil intent, okay? It's just a little sidebar here, but what I'm saying is that's what Romans 3, 2 through 4 is getting at. They were entrusted with the oracles of God. Do you think the oracles are tainted by the fact that they failed sometimes? They're not. That's not what it's about. It's about the writing. Let God be true, though every one of them was a liar. As it's written, you may be justified in your words. You may prevail when you are judged. And a lot of people are content to stop right there. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds good. I, I'm, I'm happy with these talking points. Yeah, but you need to dig deeper, friend. Where did it come from? It came from Psalm 51. And the title of Psalm 51 says, a Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, that, that is all right. Um, start getting familiar, but I can kind of clue you in on this. David was king of Israel, and he used his power as king to um, take and sleep with another man's wife. And when she became pregnant through his actions, he used his power as king to murder that, hus that man, her husband. And God sent the prophet Nathan to him to say, do you think I didn't see that? <laughs> In summary. And he penned this psalm after this, that Nathan came to him. And he repented he confessed that he sinned in this matter, and he repented, and he asked God 
to be merciful to him, and he was merciful in that he didn't take his life, but there were many consequences. This is the end of peace in the days of David. But Psalm 51 is what he penned at that time. He sinned. Now, in one place, the scripture says David is a man after God's own heart. That's true. But it doesn't mean he he hasn't got occasions of sin. And this is certainly an occasion in which he sinned. He did do wrong. So why quote that in Romans 3? Because it's the point exactly. David sinned. Though he was inspired, though he was writing psalms, he was reigning over Israel, he still managed to do wrong. And when he did so, of course, that's bad. That's bad for the reputation of God and his kingdom is true. And who is to blame for that? It is Psalm 51, verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. The fact that David did wrong is on himself, not on God. God is justified in his words. His writing is still right, even though David flaunted it or flouted it. Uh, He didn't follow the law as written. He had the writing. He knew what was right. He didn't do it. But God is still just in his words. God is still blameless in judging. David is the one who did wrong, and God's power is not nullified by the fact that David did wrong. That's the point. Notice the way he closes this out in the 11th verse down to the 13th. Cast, not away from, or cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from your presence, take not your Holy Spirit from me, restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way, your ways. Sinners will return to you. Even after this sin that he did, he asked God not to take away that Holy Spirit. There's the breath, the breath of God. Don't stop giving your words. And he wants to be restored to this place where he teaches transgressors the ways of God, where sinners are turned back to God by 13th verse, I will teach. God did allow his Holy Spirit to remain on David, Psalm 51 is proof of this. After the fact of the sin, after Nathan went to him and he repented, and he's suffering many consequences for the sin, God allowed him, inspired him, to write the 51st Psalm and others. David can still be a vehicle for turning sinners back to God through the words, the words of Scripture. And if you fast forward to Acts chapter 2, you know this. I just want to point out this fact that's recorded there. There's, uh, there's a lot of things happening there, but I just want to point out this one thing. That when the apostles stood up in Acts chapter 2, after the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension to heaven, and began to address the crowd of Israel, they said, in part, at the 24th verse, God raised Jesus up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It was not possible for Jesus to be held by death. Why was it not possible for him to be held by death? Because, verse 25, David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. And it goes on from there. What is it? It's a quotation from the Psalms, a Psalm of David. The point is, 
When David says in a psalm, for example, Acts 2, 27, you will not abandon my soul to the underworld. You will not allow your Holy One to see decay. Or verse 26, my flesh dwells in hope because you won't allow your Holy One to see decay. When that psalm gets written, that word of God is spoken, it is sealed. The Christ, the Son of God, who fulfills that prophecy, will not remain bound by death. He will be loosed from death. He will be resurrected. Because the psalm said so. Not because David said so, but because God said so through David. His writing David's writing of the psalm is still binding. It's still in force. Not because David was in force or because David always did right. He didn't always do right. But because God inspired that. God breathed those words. They're not David's words. They're God's words. Although David was the messenger by whom they were written down, they're the words of God. And since God said... He would not undergo decay. It was not possible for him to be held by death. Not even possible. We think resurrection is not possible. They're saying, you know, the Holy Spirit says, no, it's the other way around. Him remaining dead is impossible because I said he would be rising from the dead. That's kind of cool. I think that's really fun there in Acts 2. <laughs> That's the power of God's Word. Now consider this too. In Galatians, didn't Paul say the same thing? Not just about ancient Israel, not just rallying the example of David, the one place that we can point to where David sinned. And even then, God inspires him to write a psalm about it after the fact. And other psalms that are binding, according to Acts 2. What about himself? Well, Galatians 1, Paul said, it's 6 through 8, I'm astonished you're quickly, so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ. You're so quickly turning to a different gospel, I'm astonished. Not that there's really another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Paul acknowledged the possibility that he himself could go astray when he wrote to them and said specifically at verse 9, or I'm sorry, at verse 8, even if we, that's Paul, an apostle, and all the brothers with me, if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary, let him be accursed. He acknowledged that he could go astray. He maybe could do something that was wrong. And he didn't want us to follow him. He wanted us to follow Scripture. You don't follow me into error. You follow the Bible. If I, do, if I go off into error, you stay with the Bible. Paul could say that. I can say that. Any one of us can tell our, anybody around us. But of course, you who are familiar with the text, know that it was Peter we're talking about to whom it was revealed that all the nations were included and that the law of Moses was a means to an end. And the end is Christ. But he got caught up in hypocrisy. He started pretending that the Jews were, in fact, different from the Gentiles. That's recorded for us in, in Galatians 2. And when Paul corrects Peter in front of everybody, according to the instructions of 1 Timothy 5, the elders that are sinning rebuke in the presence of, the, of, of all so that the, the rest may fear. He said to him, In the 17th verse of Galatians 2, If in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, 
Is Christ then a servant of sin? Yeah, what if some were unfaithful? Does that nullify God's faithfulness? No. If in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we were also found sinners, is Christ a servant of sin therefore? No. If I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself a transgressor. Our teaching is contrary to the way that you have been acting, Peter. That's what that means. The fact that you've acted this way doesn't mean that Christ is a servant of sin, a minister of sin, the author of confusion. No, it doesn't mean that. What if some were unfaithful? Well, let them all be unfaithful, but God is still true in his word. It's kind of hard to accept that, I think, but I, I'm still going to you know, stand by it. You, you can see that that is the meaning, the clear meaning of Romans 3, is that, yeah, some of them sinned. In fact, we know for sure that some of those inspired men who wrote inspired psalms definitely sinned, and yet God allowed His Holy Spirit to stay with them and caused His words to be written through them, not to defend David, not to defend Israel, to defend the Bible. What was written is exactly what God intended to have written. No matter what the people, imperfect vessels though we might be, <laughs> have done or have not done, God's Word is true. What is written is what he wants written. This is binding. This is true. And turn you in closing to Matthew 22. Thanks for your kind attention. But I think the most powerful words on this subject are the words that Jesus himself said. In the Jewish gospel, Matthew's gospel, the gospel written to those who were Jewish by a man who himself was Jewish, well acquainted with their customs and the way things were in modern, or in, uh, I say, contemporaneous Judea, first century Judea. And when Jesus answers those who don't believe in resurrection from the dead, he said to them in Matthew 22, 29, you're wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. That's a setup. You don't know the Scriptures. You don't know the power of God. That's a setup for the 31st verse. As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead. He's God of the living. The significance of this, of course, is that quotation at verse 32, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When did he say that? He said that in Exodus chapter 3, in the burning bush, when he appeared to Moses. Moses wanted to know who this is. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Some 400 years after their death, God is their God. How's that possible? What's well, because they're still alive? Because there's life after death. And he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. They must therefore be alive. When he said this to Moses in Exodus 3, that's mind-blowing for Moses on the one hand, but what Jesus is saying is a one step higher than that, which is Exodus 3, when God says this to Moses, is, according to Matthew 22, verse 31, what God said to you. Have you not read what was said to you by God? That's the most powerful thing that anybody has to say about this. What Jesus says right there, what does it mean? It means God speaks to every one of us through the Bible. This was written for you. God is speaking. Are you listening? 
God is speaking. Are you listening? Are you reading the Bible? Do you read it as a history, as a tradition, as a story, a fable? Or are you listening to see what it is that God wants you to do? Because that's the completion of the inspiration of God. The reason that His Holy Spirit deigns to speak these words is so that you and I will listen to these words and we'll take them in and they'll become part of our spirit, and we will live right. We will be what he wants us to be, the same way that the Bible is what he wanted to be written. We can have that open book life with God. Are you a Christian? Are you a child of God? Become a Christian to have forgiveness of sins, to have a hope of resurrection. It was impossible that he shouldn't be raised from the dead. And it's impossible that he would break his promise to you and me. If you need to be baptized in the name of Christ, we have water prepared. Are you a Christian already? But perhaps have not lived right. Repent, make things right with God. Let us pray with you and for you that you can be restored to him. Steal um, your resolve and rededicate yourself to the study of his word. If we can help you with our prayers, we'll do it. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. 